Thank you. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Richard Lockhead. Up to 10 minutes, Minister. Presenting officer, the UK Government introduced levelling up in 2020, signalling it as the central agenda for making the UK a fairer place to live and reduce inequality. The linchpin of this agenda, the Leveling Up Fund, we were told, seeks to improve everyday life across the UK. But after two rounds of funding, we see very little evidence that it's working. In fact, Bloomberg analysis released in January shows that only 3% of Scotland has levelled up, according to the metrics involved. That means 97% of Scotland have felt little to no impact from the funding or the UK Government's intervention. So levelling up does indeed mean losing out for many of Scotland's communities. And I want to lay out the evidence as to why that's the case. Firstly, there is the inept delivery of the fund that has left the most deprived areas without any awards. Secondly, there is the constitutional issue at the core of all of this, one that Scottish ministers have raised time and time again, which demonstrates the disrespect the UK Government has for Scottish devolution. This fund also exemplifies the UK Government's tendency to shift the goalposts for stakeholders making decisions without consultation or advance notice. The first of these occurred when they announced plans in their autumn 2020 spending review for the £4 billion levelling up fund exclusively for England, advising that consequential funding of £800 million would be provided for devolved governments in the usual way. The usual way is, of course, via the Barnett formula for consequentials to allow expenditure in devolved areas. So through this, the Scottish Government expected to receive around £430 million, which we would have used in a manner that met the needs of all Scottish regions and supported work that promotes core policies such as community wealth building, tackling child poverty and regional economic development. Yet, the introduction of the infamous Internal Market Act allowed the UK Government to backtrack at the last minute, announcing in the 2021 Spring Budget, without discussion with Scottish Ministers, that this fund would be UK-wide. The UK Government then kept the consequentials and used them to increase the fund to £4.8 billion and apply it directly in devolved areas. It is unacceptable and undermines the devolution settlement for the UK Government to use the powers it has gifted itself through the Internal Market Act to bypass the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government in ways that could contradict and do contradict the devolved priorities of Scotland. It is concerning that with approximately £80 million left for Scotland, we think, just under half of all our local authorities have yet to receive any support from this fund. Think about that for a second. £3.8 billion has been allocated from the Leveling Up Fund by the UK Government, and 14 councils in Scotland have not received a penny. So it's the view of this Government that the remaining funding should be passed to the Scottish Parliament, as was initially intended, to enable targeted and focused support for those areas most in need of levelling up. Now, even though most of this fund, of course, as I've just said, has been allocated, we could at least make the best of a bad lot. And one of the most scathing, scathing criticisms of the levelling up fund came from the Conservative Mayor for the West Midlands, Andy Street, who recently noted that this is just another example as to why Whitehall's bidding and begging, board cu begging bowl culture is broken. And then he went on to say, the sooner we can decentralise and move to proper fiscal devolution, the better. Now, in Scotland, we could have used this funding in line with Scottish priorities. Our recently published regional economic policy reviews, for instance, set out the trajectory for the future delivery of regional economic development and builds on the commitments made in the National Strategy for Economic Transformation. We would seek to issue funding to our regional partners in line with all the recommendations that were made by the experts who led that review. These would deliver, for instance, the core strategic projects that matter to our regions, build capacity in our local authorities, support sectorial strengths, and create things like intelligence hubs, which have been proposed for every region. But not only have the UK Government shifted the goalposts in the Scottish Government, removing expected consequentials without consultation, they also treated our local authorities with the same disdain. Essentially, a, a, a note on the assessment and decision-making process, and that's in quotations, produced by the UK Government months after bids were submitted, 
said that ministers had suddenly decided to take account of which local authorities had received funding in the first round, noting that this would help maximise the geographical spread of investment across, across rounds one and two. So put that in plain English, this meant anywhere that was successful in the first round would not get funding in the second round, regardless of the quality of the bids submitted. However, at no point did the UK Government think to tell local authorities who had invested time and effort in creating bids that weren't even going to be considered. So that lack of respect is astounding. And Susan Aitken, the leader of the Glasgow City Council, confirmed in the article that she had in the Herald, bidders were not told about this in advance, resulting in huge expense to work up the detailed and labour-intensive proposal. Councillor Aitken wrote to levelling up Secretary Michael Gove, stating in the weeks leading up to the decision, and I quote again, your officials were in dialogue with ours and at no stage was there ever any suggestion that places successful in round one would not be eligible for round two funding. So by not making this clear from the outset, Scottish local authorities have wasted time, effort and money developing bids that were ultimately dismissed on the basis of geography rather than need. It's not for Scottish ministers, of course, to speak on behalf of councils, but it is not unreasonable to suggest that many of them would have entered different projects in round one had they known from the outset they'd only be getting a single bite of the cherry. So while Scottish projects have received 9% of all awards from this fund of the 29 local authorities that submitted bids in round two, only 10 were successful. And at a practical level, however, Social Sector Consultancy MPC noted last year that Scotland only received 3.5% of levelling up funding, despite having 8.2% of the population. And Scottish local authorities with the highest homelessness rates, for instance, received less levelling up funding in 2022 than those areas with the lowest. The UK Government claimed this fund is about reducing inequality, but they have made it about geographical spread, and of course, as I've said before, they've even have failed to achieve that. And we know it's not really about reducing inequality when we see the full picture of the awards. Rural and peripheral regions and areas of deprivation have not been prioritised or targeted by this UK fund. Whilst not all councils applied to the fund, possibly due to the convoluted processes involved, five of the least well-off council areas in Scotland received no award from round two. Glasgow, North Ayrshire, Renfrewshire, South Lanarkshire and Western Bartonshire are all ranked in the top 10 most deprived areas according to the Scottish Index of Multiple Pro uh, Deprivation, yet were overlooked for funding in round two. In comparison, nearly £40 million was awarded to some of Scotland's least deprived areas. It's difficult to reconcile the rhetoric of levelling up as the great reducer of inequality with the clip provided, for instance, by the New Statesman, in which the Prime Minister was captured last year, telling Conservative activists that I managed to start changing the funding formulas to make sure that areas like Tunbridge Wells are getting the funding they deserve. And funnily enough, of course, Mr Sunak's own wealthy Richmond constituency was awarded £19 million. How does this reduce inequality when Scotland's most deprived areas, like Mary Hill and Postle Park, had projects rejected? or even my own constituency of Murray, which did not receive investment for their bid, which involved a similar sum for a similar regeneration package for which uh, the PM's backyard was given a, a successful uh, uh, award. It's also worth noting the biggest regional recipient is the northwest of England, which received £350 million, and of course just so happens to be the Red Wall, where the Conservatives are most vulnerable to losing marginal seats to Labour. This is compared to the whole of Scotland, who in comparison was awarded £177 million, approximately half that amount. So even a cursory analysis of this fund exposes that this is not about poorer communities to being levelled up. It is clear this fund is nothing more than a dash for cash, where political glad-handing takes precedence over meaningful, strategic and targeted investment for our poorer communities. Levelling up should not mean losing out, but it does. Again, recent Bloomberg analysis shows that in 2019, 597 of the 650 constituencies were behind London and the South East in at least six of the 12 levelling up metrics analysed. So, as I mentioned earlier, in Scotland, only 3% of all constituencies were shown to be levelling up overall. And as we know, levelling up cuts across many areas of devolved policy, such as transport, justice, culture, skills and education. So we fundamentally disagree with the principle of the UK government making decisions in devolved areas. 
In 2021, as I said before, the UK Government changed its mind on plans to confine this fund to England and deliver extra barn consequentials to the Scottish Government. Instead, they kept all the funding and are issuing it in a manner that fails to reduce inequality in any meaningful way. So if we had control of this funding, we do the right thing with it and uh, support Scotland's priorities. But in closing, we will now invite the Secretary of State for Leveling Up, Michael Gove, to a face-to-face -face meeting in order to discuss the future of the fund, setting our intention to deliver true devolution through investment in accordance with our aim to create a well-being economy for Scotland. The IMF is forecasting that the UK will be the only major economy to contract in 2023. So the UK economy is fundamentally in the wrong path, with no real alternative and offer within the current system. And communities have been damaged by UK policies like Brexit and other UK budget decisions. So the UK Government must devolve the remaining funding to the Scottish Government so that we can see meaningful support delivered to regions and regional stakeholders bringing together public, private and third sector economic actors so we can tackle inequalities within and between their regions. Uh, this would be true res respectful partnership working between all areas of government and not the top-down, power-grabbing and ineffective fund that we see right now. Thank you. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we'll move on to the next item of business. And I'd be grateful if all members who wish to ask a question were to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Jamie Halcrew Johnston. Uh, thank the Minister for advance sight of that statement. Um, although I would have hoped, if not expected, that it might be a bit more than page after page of reheated grievance. It's certainly 11 minutes. None of us are going to get back. Because while the SNP might not be able to find anything positive to say, this levelling up funding has been welcomed in communities across Scotland. Yeah. Councillor Emma Macdonald, the leader of Shetland Islands Council, said, and I quote, it's no exaggeration to say that this funding from the UK government has saved Fair Isle as an inhabited island. There would have been no other way for us to sustainably fund such a project. This is a truly great day for Fair Isle and for Shetland, and we're grateful for the honest, open and productive dialogue we have had both with the Scotland Office and the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities throughout the process. Presiding officer councils across the country applied for support, including some run by the SNP themselves, and many welcomed the very fact that this additional funding, on top of Barnet consequentials the Scottish Government already receives, was applied for directly by local authorities and not funnelled through the Scottish Government's sticky coffers in Edinburgh. And the Minister failed to acknowledge that the percentage of funding received by Scotland is actually higher than the Scotland's percentage of population. As a country, we are a net beneficiary of this UK support. So will the Minister recognise that this ministerial miserabilism from the SNP is in stark contrast to the welcome it has received in communities across Scotland? Does he accept that communities across Scotland don't care where the funding comes from? And if the UK Government is delivering support where the SNP ministers aren't, then it's for the Scottish Government to step up. And does he recognise that the Scottish public want to see their two governments working together and working with local authorities on issues like levelling up funding and on city and regional deals and on issues like free ports? What they don't want is more of this nonsensical grievance mongering from SNP ministers. Minister. Um, I think the member's question gets to the heart of the two key issues here, actually. Firstly, he mentioned the Shetland Award, and no one in this chamber or this government uh, blames local authorities for applying for funding that the UK government makes available. But, of course, he will know that in round two, with the Highlands and Islands being identified by the UK government in the lowest level of need, the lowest level of need, only Shetland got an award. The rest of the Highlands and Islands didn't get a penny. Indeed, Argyll and Butte, the Western Isles, indeed my own constituency of Murray, out of the £3.8 billion announced by the UK Government so far, out of both rounds, have not received a penny. How on earth can the member say that is levelling up? And the second point is about the UK Government and the Scottish Government working together. Well, this mess would have not happened had the UK Government been willing to work with the Scottish Government. <laughs> 
But the irony, of course, is that the UK government changed its mind and used the Internal Market Act to change its mind and devolving the consequentials to this Parliament and to this government and decided to directly allocate and ride roughshod over Scottish devolution. So unlike Let's the growth hear the deals, minister. Unlike the growth deals and unlike the green fee ports, the UK government is not willing to work with the Scottish government on this issue. If they had, we might have got this right and we have not been in a position where 14 local authorities in Scotland missed out on getting a penny from the £3.8 billion announced for so-called levelling up so far. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, uh, and I thank the Minister for advanced sight. Uh, there is a gap of around a third in terms of earnings per hour work between the lowest and highest performing uh, cities in Scotland. Indeed, five local authorities in Scotland have actually seen a productivity decline in the last decade. So I agree. The levelling up fund is insufficient compared to structural funds they replace, isn't transparent and bypassed devolution. Indeed, my colleague Chris Bryant described it as corrupt, and I wouldn't disagree with that assessment. But beyond city region deals, uh, there is no locus or structure, uh, particularly in Scotland. And I, I note the, 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 the report on the 19th of December for the, from the Regional Economic uh, 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 um, uh, Act, uh, Advisory Group. And it states that there should be enhanced structures and autonomy for regional economic development. So when will there be a formal response to that and with a clear plan for regional economic plans with investment to back up so we can close that gap between our lowest and highest performing cities? Thank you. Minister. I mentioned in my uh, opening uh, statement that we have uh, 11 recommendations, I think it is, from a recent review of working with the, the regional partnerships and taking forward regional policy. And that's the way in which we would have approached this issue had that money been devolved to the Scottish Parliament. We'd have worked with local partners, local authorities, and got this right and made strategic intervention to really address tackling inequalities and support local economic development in Scotland. But there are a number of measures we're taking. We've got, for example, the £325 million place-based investment programme which includes the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund and we've got many other measures in place where we work with local partners and identify local priorities as well. But many of these issues are reserved and here we've had the £349 million we could have allocated in line with Scotland's priorities if the UK Government had not overridden devolution and uh, allocated it directly, uh, missing the targets and making a mess of the levelling up agenda. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to ask about levelling up in this chamber. And as it's one of the central tenets that I understand is that the UK Government's fund seems to be that it should bypass the Scottish Parliament entirely and avoid the inconvenience of democratic oversight. This is, of course, it of course contrasts with decades of EU structural funding, which was allocated by coordination between the European Commission, the Scottish Government and local communities, and delivered, for example, through the Leader Programme. Does the Minister share my concern that Westminster has encroached on devolved responsibilities and failing to engage directly with communities? Minister. Emma Harper is correct. This is another example of the UK Government's aggressive approach to the constitutional settlement in, in the UK and riding roughshod over Scottish devolution and showing utter disrespect to this Parliament and indeed the Scottish Government. And one prime example of that is the fact that if you look at European funding, which I think the member referred to, that did identify, for instance, Scotland's rural areas and more remote areas as being areas of need, whereby the UK Government, taking over this fund, changing its mind over devolving the fund to Scotland, decided these areas are not in need. These areas have the lowest need in Scotland, which is an outrageous position. And as a result, uh, much of this funding is missed out, those uh, areas most in need in Scotland. Jamie Green, to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I feel sorry for the government benches today. They've all clearly got out of bed on the wrong side this morning because not one of them has got anything positive to say about this fund. And I know that my constituents on the West Coast are pleased to have over £100 million invested in Inverclyde, North Ayrshire, Renfrewshire, Dumbartonshire. It's hardly Tory heartland, is it, Minister? But will he uh, answer this question, though? We are still reeling from the lack uh, of support for our free port bid, and there is a clear lack of strategy from the Scottish Government over our marine and port infrastructure. What we would like to see over on the West, though, uh, aside from this welcome uh, UK Government investment, is a clear direction of travel from this Government over how it's going to properly invest in our marine infrastructure, underused and uh, uh, underutilised by this Government. And we want to see a strategy, and we need it soon, Minister. Minister. 
As I have said in previous answers, we will continue to work with regional partners, rolling out some of the funding I have already mentioned that is available from the Scottish Government. Uh, and indeed, we will continue to make representations to the UK Government that their funds take into account strategic priorities in Scotland as well. When the member mentioned the welcome that some of the projects have been given in his part of the world, can I reiterate, no one blames local authorities for applying for funding made available by the UK Government. What we are saying here is this was sold as a levelling up agenda, and he has not been able to say, when he was asking his question, how these awards supported the levelling up agenda. There are many different funds with many different objectives. The purpose of this was to tackle inequalities across the country, target areas most in need, and deliver a levelling up agenda. And clearly, in most cases, it has absolutely failed to do that. Kenneth Gibson, to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Not only is the UK providing less funding than Europe, the Institute for Public Policy Research has calculated that the UK Government's failure to inflation proof levelling up funding has cost communities over half a billion pounds. Has the Minister been advised as to whether or not the UK Government will rectify this shortfall and fill the inflation gap caused in part by the UK Government's own economic incompetence? Minister. Uh, Kenneth Gibson again highlights an important point, but I have to tell him we have had no feedback as of yet from the UK Government as to the future of the levelling up fund or taking into account any inflationary pressures or any other factors. And as I said again in my statements, we are asking the levelling up secretary for a face to face meeting to discuss the future of the fund. But I do suspect they've been so embarrassed by this negative response to the fund throughout the UK, including from prominent members of the Conservative Party, that there may be some doubt in the future, I don't know, but we wait to hear formally from the UK Government about its future. Pauline McNeill, to be followed by Claire Adamson. The Minister rightly laments the failure of Glasgow to receive funding despite the economic need that it clearly has in this round of awards. But how many pleadings does the Scottish Government need to hear from Glasgow business leaders about also being left behind by this and also the rejection of the Clyde Freeport bid with the highest levels of deprecation across the region? So does the Minister agree with me and business leaders in Glasgow uh, that, that Glasgow has strategic importance to the economy and it actually should be compared to cities such as Manchester? And is the Scottish Government going to recognise that we need a plan to enhance existing fund funding and support the feelings of levelling up. Minister. Uh, uh, Paul McNeill is perfectly correct in terms of talking about the uh, importance of the City of Glasgow strategically to the whole of Scotland and the, the Scottish economy. I absolutely agree with that point. But again, I think she makes the Scottish Government's point for us in that we would like to do more to help the City of Glasgow. But when £349 million they are supposed to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament and Government so we could work with Glasgow City Council and others to help the city's future. But then the UK Government changes its mind and decides to allocate it directly and rejects some of the most uh, important applications from those areas with the most need in Glasgow. Then I hope she appreciates the challenges we face dealing with making sure that the resources go to the right places. Claire Adamson to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Minister, a significant proportion of this so-called levelling up money seems to have gone to wealthy areas in England, such as the Prime Minister's constituencies. Meanwhile, post-industrial areas at Ravenscraig in my constituency, betrayed for decades by Conservative governments, continue to be overlooked. Does the Minister share my belief that this was a missed opportunity to right the wrongs of the past? And would he join me in inviting the Tory benches who have been talking about grievance all afternoon to come and speak to my constituents in Motherwell and Wisha and explain to them why they have been let down by Tory governments yet again? Minister. Well, I know the members have rejected the Conservative Party at the ballot box for decades now, and I have no doubt whatsoever that is set to continue in the years ahead as well, given their track records uh, in that part of the world also. Um, I can only reiterate again that we would have liked the UK Government to have stuck to its word and devolved the funding so we could have worked with the members' local authority and regional partners to deliver this fund where it had been most effective and make strategic interventions to tackle inequality and support local economic development. Willie Rennie to be followed by Alistair Allen. I, I get the Minister is, is upset that he's been ignored uh, by the Conservative Government, but isn't he a little bit embarrassed that it's taken a UK Conservative Government to fund the Lifeline Ferry to the Fair Isle, which should have been funded by the Scottish Government years ago? But, but why should councils be stuck 
in the middle between two feuding governments and their inability to agree with each other? Minister. Well, the reason why the uh, the Shetland Islands and our communities have to deal with two governments is because Scotland's not independent right yet. And if we were, it would just simply be able to get on with things and do the right things for Scotland with the powers of an independent country. Um, I can only say to the member that he talks about one specific project and he uh, hails that project. And, you know, the, the local authority clearly, as I said before, had every right to apply for funding is available. But does he think it's right under a levelling up agenda that the £27 million ferry and infrastructure for the Fair Isle was the only project supported in the whole of the Highlands and Islands, which Europe and this government and others think is one of the areas with the biggest need in Scotland for tackling inequalities and local economic development, but the UK government deemed as the area with the lowest need. Alistair Allen to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Well, as the Minister has mentioned, uh, and it's worth mentioning again, uh, out of the whole of the Highlands and Islands, only one of many bids was successful uh, in this round of the UK government's levelling up uh, funding decisions. And given that my own constituency previously quite rightly benefited enormously from EU structural funding, does the Minister believe that the UK Government's watered-down replacement for EU funding is equitable and fit for purpose, or does it just demonstrate again how far removed the UK Government is from the needs of rural and island communities? Minister. Well, the member highlights how his own constituency has been missed out and deemed by the UK Government as an area with no need for levelling up uh, so far out of £3.8 billion, £3 billion allocated by the UK Government, not one penny has gone to Alistair Allen's constituency so far. And of course, he's quite right to raise this is not the first example of his part of the world being missed out. Uh, European funding is going to be in decline. Uh, another broken promise from the UK Government to match European funding following Brexit. Uh, and of course, now we see what's happening with the levelling up fund. According to the UK Government, there's no need for levelling up in Alistair Allen's constituency. That's why we will make representations to the UK Government for the remaining £80 million or thereabouts that we believe is still remaining on the table that should, have been, uh, should be forthcoming through consequentials if the UK decides not to hold on to that and allocate it under its own uh, uh, warped formulas. Ariane Burgess to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you. I welcome the Minister's call to devolve the remaining levelling up funding to the Scottish Government so we can spend it on our own priorities. Round two of the funding yielded nothing for Highland Council and very few successful builds, as we've heard, in the wider region. Among the projects that missed out were plans to improve Portree Harbour and improvements to the NC500 and harbours at Wick and Ullapool. Indeed, the vital area of transport connectivity is excluded from evaluations for Scottish projects. Does the Minister agree with me that the current scheme is vulnerable to Tory cherry-picking and fails to address rural inequality, especially in relation to transport links? Minister. Uh, yes, of course, I agree with the member for um, a couple of reasons. Firstly, uh, the Scottish Government, as you know, were carved out of the process by the UK Government in allocating this fund. One reason we made to the UK Government as to why devolved uh, responsibility should be taken into account and respected is the issue of transport, which fe features heavily in the levelling up fund. But the UK Government refused to take into account or speak to the likes of Transport Scotland and looking at the strategic um, priorities they have and the metrics they use for determining how to allocate transport funds. And as a result, many wrong decisions were taken by the UK Government and the priorities of our local communities, and particularly in the more rural communities, uh, as Arlene Burgess mentions, of the Highlands and Islands, uh, were completely ignored. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the statement you indicate, Minister, that this would have had better impact if delivered by the Scottish Government working with local government and communities. The reality is, however, Minister, that the Scotland received 9.2% of levelling up fund compared to 8.2% in the rest of the UK per head of population. 18 out of 32 local authorities benefited from these funds, all welcoming the money they are going to receive. Yeah. Therefore, how can the Scottish Government maintain that Scotland is losing out when it is receiving more funding per head of population? Minister. The member may do well to remind himself this was called a levelling up fund, not a dash for cash for those local authorities that could put the quickest applications together because they were given a limited window for which to apply for the money. 
and as a result, we have the mess we're dealing with now. It should have been a strategic intervention working with the Scottish Government and the members' local authority and regional partners so we could have actually tackled inequality and support local economic development. The levelling up agenda has failed the whole of Scotland. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Minister highlighted in his statement, many local authorities, including Aberdeen City Council, invested a significant resource into preparing a comprehensive bid for Round 2 funding, only to be told at the very last minute they were not, in fact, eligible. Does the Minister agree with me that this shambolic state of affairs should be rectified by the Scottish Government, by the UK Government, I beg your pardon, as a matter of urgency by refunding the significant costs incurred by councils that prepared unsuccessful bids? And does he further agree that the UK Government must provide urgent clarity clarification on the criteria to be set for future funding rounds. Minister. Uh, yes, I think the way in which local authorities were not informed about the change of rules shows utter disrespect to local authorities like Aberdeen and others who are unaware that those that had been successful in round one would not be considered for round two. Given the tight financial constraints facing uh, all local authorities in Scotland uh, and, of course, the Scottish Government, it really is um, a terrible thing to do at a time when every penny counts and public services are under such pressure to allow, to sit back and allow local authorities to waste, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of pounds applying for funds that the, where the rules have been changed but they hadn't been told and as a result they didn't have a chance of being successful. And Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Whilst uh, it is certainly the case that the way in which this has been managed has been deeply regrettable and frustrating, particularly for Glasgow, the People's Palace still remains derelict. No funding from Edinburgh for Glasgow's museums, yet Edinburgh's museums are given national funding. The M8 is crumbling and that project for levelling up funding remains as critical as ever. These are projects that have the business cases developed, are ready to go, they are shovel ready. Uh, to quote the Deputy First Minister. So can the Scottish Government look to collaborate with Glasgow City Council to raise funding, perhaps through local government bond issues, or investigate other ways in which we can capitalise these projects, because they are needed as badly as ever? Minister. Well, I can remember the People's Palace from my youth, uh, and uh, I'm interested in the, the Member's question, but I do suggest, of course, she writes the Cultural Secretary about what uh, options the Scottish Government may have or, or not, given the current financial uh, constraints that we all face. But quite simply, a lot of the investment decisions in Scotland are dependent on decisions taken in Westminster, and the levelling up fund is yet another example where the wrong decisions are taken uh, and where the, the, uh, the devolution settlement in Scotland and indeed the other devolved administrations have been completely ignored uh, and the UK government has chosen to ride, ride roughshod over Scottish democracy. Thank you. That concludes that particular ministerial statement. There will be a, a brief pause before we move on to the next item of business.